So Rohan is now our second guest ever um, and keeping in the spirit of bringing on people who are much more qualified than myself. Um, Rohan, I'll let you tell any viewers your background. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I went to high school with Bratcher, uh, but after leaving Central Florida, went to Emory University where I majored in finance and then spent seven years working at Capital One, most recently as a senior manager setting credit policy and product strategy for new to credit customers. Uh, throughout my time at Capital One, I helped analyze and set credit policies across the customer lifecycle from approved decline decisions, credit line assignment, and then deciding how to raise customers' credit lines over time as they grew as customers with us. Cool. Um, and also, also did that across all kinds of different customer types, you know, consumers with low credit scores, high credit scores, small businesses, uh, lots of flavors there. Um, now I'm in Chicago pursuing my MBA at University of Chicago Booth, uh, finishing on my first year right now, really exploring entrepreneurship and venture capital, um, but continuing to kind of stay plugged in with the payments industry and, and fintechs that are kind of evolving that space. Great. So obviously in kind of the vein of credit, I want to touch on a few things because you, as you said, you weren't, it's not like you were just working with, hey, I, you know, large institutional money, you know, it sounds like there was a little bit of retail in there as well, small businesses, et cetera, kind of everything under the sun in terms of how you use credit. Um, a lot of people watch Dave Ramsey. I don't know if you've ever caught Dave Ramsey's opinions on credit. <laughs> I, which, I have not. Okay, so and and to be fair, Dave, Dave Ramsey's audience is more so people who are in debt. So his kind of war cry for the last I don't know how many years has been just don't use a credit card. I personally don't agree with that, um, as long as you're responsible enough to use one. But I also don't know. I mean, even for myself, you know, the way I use a credit card is I have one and I put things on it because I get points and rewards in exchange for that. But I'm not, you know, waiting till the final second to pay it off either. Right. Like I have the money to pay it off. I'll pay it off. Um, and I feel responsible enough to do that. But in your mind, you know, let's just let's just take an individual or I guess what we would call a retail customer. You know, what's what is the best use of a credit card? Right. Well, credit can be dangerous. Right. Credit is a loan. Somebody's going to give you money and they're going to expect that you pay them back and they're going to have and money's not free either. Right. If you're they're going to give you money to borrow, you're usually going to have to pay back more than what they initially gave you. And so that's why debt is dangerous. Credit is dangerous. Loans are dangerous. If you don't pay back, you're going to be assessed fees. You're going to be assessed interest charges. Uh, but credit cards are really the kind of gateway of credit because you don't have to pay back more than what you borrow. It's you can only borrow, you can borrow exactly as much as you want. And the good thing about credit is that you can get rewarded for using your credit cards, uh, but you'll also be penalized if you use them with bad, be with, uh, bad behavior. So you have to understand what the terms of your loan are and there are a lot of really predatory lenders out there who will have hidden gotcha fees who will assess really high fees if you miss your payment by one day but for people really getting started out with credit cards it is beneficial because you need to build a credit score over time okay so let's dig into because that's something and to, again i obviously work in finance industry Credit scores confuse the hell out of me because, and granted, you know, I was able to secure a loan for my home and my car and I had credit issues, but every now and then when I go check on it, to me, it seems like, you know, okay, you took out credit, you took out a loan for the car. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I not only pay my loan on time, I pay in excess of, of what's being asked. And occasionally, like, I feel like I checked it recently and said, why am I being, my credit score is being docked for this, it seems like. So can you give some insight into, one, how a credit score even gets calculated? And then two, obviously, the, the importance of having a quality credit score and what that gives you access to. Right. Yeah, your, your credit score, it's basically your financial report card. 
So, you know, when we were kids, we used to all hear about this, you know, your permanent record <laughs> and, you know, your future employer or the person or a bank, they're not going to care how many detentions you had in high school, but they will care if you're financially irresponsible. So that permanent record, it actually does exist in the real world. And your credit score is, is kind of that from a financial perspective. And so your credit score determines what kind of terms you can get on a loan when you need to buy a house, put down a down payment, when you want to take out a loan for a car, when you want to even get a lease for a rental application. All of these People, these people who are going to lend you money, give you very expensive things and expect you to pay them back later, they're going to use your credit score to determine how credit worthy you are. And so, uh, you know, you ask what kind of goes into a credit score. So the most traditional credit score that everyone uses is FICO. And so FICO is this company that started in, I think, like the 1950s and basically started taking everybody's financial data and putting it into a score. So it ranges from 300 to 850, and you basically start around 500 to 600. And then if you use your credit responsibly, you go up towards 850. If you use your credit irresponsibly, you go down towards 300. And having a good credit score can really be like a VIP pass with these banks to get those premium credit cards, to get those great loan terms. And so it is really important that you build your credit over time because that gives you that advantage to go and get loans. You know, you got to spend money to make money, right? And if you don't have it, where are you going to get it from? You need to go get a loan. Okay. So let me ask then, I mean, is, is it the lower your credit score goes, I guess the terms of any loan agreement get less advantageous, right? Like if I have a credit score of 400 and I'm looking for a loan and maybe 4% is competitive, but they say, well, your credit score is pretty awful. You're not going to get a 4% loan. I'm giving you a 10% loan. I mean, is that more accurate or, or is it even grounds for, hey, I'm not giving you a loan at all. I can't trust you. It may be grounds for you're not going to get a loan at all. You may now have to go to one of those sketchier payday lenders to get your loan because those are the people who are willing to take risks on somebody who has shown that they are not able to handle credit well. Now, there are ways to build your credit back up and that's a good thing. You know, the best thing about people who are starting out is credit cards are willing to take credit card companies are willing to take that first bet on you a lot more than, you know, a mortgage lender may, for example. So when you're starting out, credit cards are a great way to kind of build that up. Now, when you're rebuilding, that's when things get more difficult is because it is then harder to get credit. You may not know the best ways to handle your credit, but you know, some 60% of your credit score is just paying your bills on time every month. And a lot of people don't know that. And a lot of people also think they need to pay their full bill every month and I recommend that you do pay your full bills every month because then you're not going to get interest fees. But sure. for somebody who doesn't have the money, who is really rebuilding their credit, just kind of paying your minimum every month, uh, it can help build your score to help you get to a point where now you can kind of pay down your debt over time with access to more credit. Okay. So and I want to make sure I don't forget, but let me write this down really quick. Okay, so talk to me about, because I've heard people use the terms good debt and bad debt when it comes to your credit score. So what's, I mean, I would, in my mind, a mortgage seems like good debt, as long as you're paying your mortgage, obviously, and your house is getting foreclosed on. To me, that's healthy, that is normal, that's an accessible way to buy a home, because most people can't buy a home in cash. Um is bad debt something like, hey, you have a credit card that's been, you know, carrying this balance for the last four years and you're not really paying it down? I mean, what's the difference between how a credit score would approach something like that? Yeah, I think you got to think about what are you actually getting out of your debt? If it's a home to live in, that's good debt. If it's a car to take you to your job and back, that's good debt. If it's a credit card that you're, you know, racking up charges on clothes or something that is really more discretionary spending and you're not paying that down and it's just racking up and it's increasing without you getting anything out of it, 
that's bad debt. And so when people have different flavors of debt, student loan debt, credit card debt, mortgage debt, a lot of people recommend, hey, pay down that credit card bill first. Okay. Because that's the thing that is going to kind of balloon out. And, you know, I do understand where people are coming from, where they say, hey, avoid credit. But it's just avoid irresponsible credit. And right now, credit card balances are kind of a bubble in this country. I think um, there's over a trillion dollars of open credit card balances in the country right now. And it's because credit cards, credit card companies make a ton of money off of these balances. And so they're willing to give people these balances because you don't have to pay it back for so long and it can keep increasing for so long without people noticing. And so that is definitely a big worry and something people need to look out for. But as long as you're handling it responsibly, you're getting kind of a twofold benefit of you know, you're getting a temporary loan to do whatever you need to do that month. It's obviously more convenient to buy things with a credit card than with cash or a check. Mm -hmm. And then if you're using it right, you can get rewarded. Yeah. So I can talk a little bit about how rewards were later. Yeah, because, please. You know, that's why I use credit cards. Like I get rewarded for using my credit card. It's also convenient. Uh, but I'm also fully paying my balance every single month on all of my credit cards. And, and that's what everybody should be doing if they can. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about how credit scores work. Some people think that it's better to just pay your minimum balance because that's what shows it's due on your account. Sure. But then you're going to be racking up interest charges. I, I can't I can't even tell you how many times I've heard people say to me that they thought that they were just supposed to pay their minimum. And then, yeah, so the version of that I've I've come across, and again, I'm, I'm not great when it comes to what goes into a credit score and the proper handling of that. Um, I've heard versions where people say, well, no, you paying off your credit card in full every single month is, I guess, this advantage because it's not showing that you can responsibly carry debt. Right, because you're wiping it all away. What the card company or the FICO score, or whatever it's going to be, what they want to see is, oh, this person can consistently carry a balance of debt, so they must be okay with this, and that's a good thing for credit somehow, which I think is incorrect, is what you're saying. Yeah, that's a really common misconception, and you know, I can tell you what goes into a credit score. It's are you paying your bills on time? Um, it is how much credit do you have available to you? So that's kind of part of what you were saying. It's not that they can, that you can carry debt, is that you have debt available and that you've been able to carry it and also pay it down. You know, that total credit available, it's kind of a signal, do banks trust you? Mm -hmm. um, the, the next thing is, is total debt. And the more debt you have, that actually lowers your score. And so you don't want to be carrying debt. You want your total debt number to be as low as possible because you're paying down your bills as often as you can. Uh, the other thing that goes into it is your age of oldest trade. So how long have you had credit at all? And so I always tell people, whatever your first credit card was, never close it. If you get it, if you get an e if you get an email from Bank of America that says, "Hey, you haven't used this credit card in five years, but it's your oldest card," go buy a coffee with it, go use it, and just make sure that that stays active because that is a big part of your credit score. Okay, so is it beneficial then? I, and I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Uh, now, granted, growing up, I think to start establishing my credit, you can tell me if this works or not. You know, my parents have their obvious, you know, their credit cards. I had a version, right, with my name on it. And I think that was their attempt to help start building my own credit from, I think, high school age. Uh, yeah. You know, that was that was the emergency card. Sometimes it was not used for emergencies, but that's uh, since I've been reprimanded for that since. Um, you know, is that a viable strategy to start building up credit for somebody's child? That is a fantastic strategy and something that I highly recommend. You know, if you have a child, you can make them an authorized user on your card. A lot of credit card companies will let you set up really strict limits on what an authorized user can even use. But now that their name is on your file, as long as you have good credit behavior, 
that will now flow down to your child. Okay. The, the flip side of that is that I have seen horror stories about parents who were not responsible with their credit and then tanked their kids' credit scores. Right, right. Okay. So that's one instance. Um, but going back to never closing your first card. So obviously I had that. That was technically my first card. The first card I ever got on my own, uh, I think it was a Banana Republic <laughs> credit card because they told me I could get 20 bucks off the jeans I was buying or whatever it was in college. Um, so I had that card and used it for a very long time. And then eventually, you know, there was really no reward system for that. And I got a little older and I started to value that more. So when I think I ended up with some Bank of America product or something that had cash back rewards and then obviously, you know, kind of moved more into the travel rewards, that sort of stuff. Um, I kept two of the three cards open, but the Banana Republic, I figured, well, I'm, I think I'm, you know, I shop at Gap still, but I don't really want the Banana Republic card anymore. And so I did end up closing it. Um, so what kind of impact does that have on a credit score? So you probably saw your score dip for a little while after that. And so it dipped because you're now your age of oldest trade probably went down from, you know, maybe seven years down to four years or something like that. Uh, your total available credit maybe went down from, you know, let's say you have 60,000 across all your other cards and you had 5,000 with the Banana Republic card. So that went from 60 down to 55. So now that's going to take a hit too. So all these things kind of play into it, but they're all temporary. And there's this like big psychological impact around how people think about their credit scores. People love to brag oh i have over an eight there's an ego thing. There for sure is an ego it's thing a about big credit. ego thing and you know people don't even want to open new credit scores because another thing that goes or credit cards because another thing that goes into your credit score is how many recent inquiries do you have you know when you applied for your mortgage you probably saw a credit score dip because that bank was you know tapped into your credit score and showed another inquiry. And that's a signal to banks about how hungry for credit you are right now. And people don't want to open credit cards because they're like, oh, they're going to do an inquiry. And it's going to drop my right. score down from 802 to 797. And I don't want that. But, <laughs> but, but, but really, like when you're talking about a range from 300 to 850, I would say over 760 is excellent credit. Okay. 720 to 760 is good. 660 to 720 is average. Uh, and then below that is really kind of like you're either just starting out or you're rebuilding. Okay. So let me then follow up with this, right? And and there's different strategies. And I guess I'll, I'll kind of explain what I mean by that. So some people have obviously multiple credit cards. And some people might go, okay, well, the rewards for or the benefits of this card are more uh, for when I go out to eat, right? I'm rewarded 3X points or whatever it is for this card. But this card is really good for travel. And I get 5X over here for travel. And this one is for whatever. And all of a sudden you got six credit cards. Now, my, my personal thought on that is, well, you have to weigh, are you paying an annual fee for those credit cards? And at what point does the annual fee outweigh the rewards? Right. But otherwise, is there such a thing as too many credit cards? Yeah, there, there can be such a thing as too many credit cards. The thing is, when you have really good credit, the banks want you as a customer. Yeah. The, the way credit, card, credit cards work is every time you swipe your credit card at a business, that business is paying 2 to 3% of that transaction to the credit card company just for the privilege of being paid with a credit card. It's a kind of crazy system that some more developing countries or more recently developing countries have fully leapfrogged. But we are kind of addicted to credit cards in the United States because people love rewards, people love the convenience, and because banks have kind of created this system that is really hard to break out of. And so, you know, if, if these banks are making 3% off of every transaction, to get you as their customer, they're willing to pay you just about that much back in rewards. Yeah, so that that is the question, right? Okay, one, how does the credit card company work with, you know, okay, I'm not paying interest on this, right? So how are you able to give me 
essentially money back in the form of rewards or cash back or whatever it may be. Um, but then also things like sign up bonuses, which I guess are another form of rewards, right? I, I mean, I know plenty of people who, whether they're going on a vacation or they're getting married, who go, oh, we just signed up for three credit cards because they're all offering us 400 bucks up front if I sign up. To me, it's kind of like if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. So is there a downside to that? And also, how do the banks have a system set up where I'm not paying interest? And obviously enough people are, but I'm not paying interest. How do I get rewarded and how do they afford to reward me? Yeah, so you know, credit cards kind of have this barbell shape uh, set of customers where on one side, you have people who are paying a lot of interest and credit card companies make a ton of money off of interest. And then on the other side, you have customers who are spending, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're getting all of that transaction fee off of them. And then in the middle, you have a ton of customers who credit card companies actually aren't making that much money off of you. And so really, it's kind of this symbiotic relationship where you're getting rewarded and the people who are really paying for that are people who don't have credit cards and are spending, you know, if I spend $10 for food at a store it, with a credit card, I'm getting back a couple percent of that in rewards. Somebody's paying for cash with that. They're not getting anything back in terms of rewards, but they're paying the same amount. And so People paying for cash are basically subsidizing rewards for people who don't pay for cash. Most companies, most businesses, they're not going to charge $10 for someone who's using a credit card and $9.70 for somebody who's paying with cash. Right. Some places you'll see that, right? Like, you know, if you go to a farmer's market, maybe you'll see like, you know, and you have to spend a minimum to use a credit card or you pay a couple extra dollars if you use a credit card. So it does happen in some places, especially in other countries. You'll see that a lot. But here it's really all baked into prices. And so it is true that you can make good money off of credit cards based on some of those sign up bonuses you talked about, based on some really rich reward programs but it takes effort, right? Like you said, can you have too many credit cards? I think you can have too many credit cards. I have friends who have dozens of credit cards. <laughs> and at a certain point, it's like, what are you doing? Like, how are you keeping track of all of these? And right. how are you making sure you use all of them enough? Oh, especially yeah. the ones with that come with annual fees. It's like, you know, you forget to use your $100 bonus at whatever yeah, store I get 10 bucks a month at a cheesecake factory i can count on zero hands the amount of time i've used that reward yeah exactly and it's and so you do need to sit down and think when you're opening up a card is this going to work for me just over the next couple of months or is this going to work for me in the long run and if yeah. it's only going to work for you in the next couple of months set a reminder to close it and your credit score is going to take a little dip when you close it but that's not worth whatever money you're losing forever by not getting the rewards out of whatever you're paying for the credit card. Okay. Um, so talk to me a little about uh, transaction fees and things like, uh, what's a good example? I mean, my, my mortgage, for instance, or um, certain insurances, it feels to me like these really big ticket items carry this really heavy, you know, a three and a half, four percent transaction fee that dissuades me from using my credit card for those types of transactions. Because in an ideal world, there is no transaction fee, right? And that's one of my larger bills every month. I would love to put that on my card and get the rewards, but the math doesn't check out because if I'm going to pay three and a half percent for a transaction fee, I'm not getting the equivalent in terms of rewards. So that leads me to, okay, now I'm ACHing from my bank. So is there a reason why these big ticket items carry such a large transaction fee? Yeah, it's, I mean, largely it's because they can. not Think about two coffee shops right next to each other. If one is saying you can pay with a credit card, buy your coffee for $4, and the other one is saying you can pay with a credit card, but you have to pay me a 4% fee, or you only have to pay in cash, you might go to the other coffee shop. 
if your mortgage or your car payment or your rental portal is saying, hey, you have to pay me a 4% fee for using this credit card, there's nowhere else for you to go. And that convenience factor for smaller businesses, it makes sense for them to just eat that fee. For big companies, for big ticket items, it doesn't make sense for them because that ends up being a big chunk of profit that they would then be losing to the credit card companies. And sure. so they want you to pay for that instead of trying to subsidize that from the person paying for cash, because guess what? No one's paying for ca with cash for their rent. Yeah, so let me then, I mean, am I right in thinking at least, you know, I've done the math. I think the math checks out of if I'm going to pay three and a half percent to use my credit card to pay my mortgage or whatever it is every month, knowing that we're going to get a little convoluted here, but knowing that the rewards I get from that are not the equivalent of the 3.5% that I pay in interest or not interest in, in transaction fees. Well, wouldn't it make sense then for me to just say, okay, well, now I'm connecting my bank. I'm not using my credit card because this three and a half outweighs the reward benefit of using the card for this particular transaction. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so you should be paying for that through your bank, but see, there are more aspects that go into it. You know, you talked about the sign up bonuses, you know, if you spend $10,000 in the first mm -hmm. six months, we'll give you a thousand dollars or, you know, a hundred thousand points or something like that. If you're not going to be able to hit that threshold otherwise, maybe it makes sense to do it that one time to get that bonus. Um, the other thing is, is that there are newer companies out there that are trying to get you rewarded for some of those big ticket items. So I signed up for a card a few months ago that is giving me rewards on my rent. And so they, you know, when I pay rent, if I use a credit card, I have to pay a 3% fee. If I use this special credit card, they cover the fee for me and they give me rewards. Hmm. And they're not making money off of that. There's no way. But now I'm a user of their credit card. And if I am using that card at my coffee shop, at the grocery store, they are going to be making money off of those transactions. And so it all shakes out for them from like a customer acquisition play, a unique a strategy proposition. Yeah, I, I compliment them for the strategy because I'm definitely going to go look at that as soon as we get off of here. Uh, but uh, so let's talk about your, you were mentioning, you know, I know Amex does it. I'm sure a number of other companies do it, right? You sign up for this card. It has an annual fee. Um, but when you sign up, if you spend $6,000 in the first month, you get 100,000 points or whatever it is. For somebody who was never going to spend $6,000 in the first month, right? Somebody who says, well, I really, I think the Amex card looks really cool. A lot of cool people I know have one. I should get one because that's cool to do. Um, oh, and it has points. Oh, but I got to spend six grand. Well, I usually only spend two grand a month, right? Does it does it make sense in that instance to say, well, I really want that card. Let me find something to buy for $4,000. I mean, the way I looked at it uh, the first time I did that was I happened to be taking a vacation that was going to be expensive. I figured, all right, well, I'll just throw the plane tickets on there and that covers that. I mean, is that a better strategy to say, hey, I know I have this expense coming up that is, is pretty non-negotiable. I'm going to wait till that time to sign up or is it, it's a good card, good rewards. I might as well take advantage of it. I'll find something to spend $6,000 on. Yeah, I, I think that people should be getting these cards when they have things that they know they're going to be spending money on. Um, I recommend people open up a new credit card when they're, you know, getting married and have a bunch of expenses, when they're moving, have a bunch of expenses, things like that, um, to get that reward. It's the same thing as Black Friday, right? Like, if you get 30% off a new TV, but you don't need a new TV, you're right. not coming out ahead. Yeah, and that, that can be, uh, I'll use this as a warning signal for really anybody. You know, I've caught myself doing it. You go to Publix, it's like, oh, that's, that's BOGO. I never wanted that in the first place. I'm saving money on on money I never would have spent unless it was on sale. And I know there's probably years and years of market research on why sales work, and there's a reason it's on sale. Uh, but yeah, no, that's a very good point. I mean, just because something seems like a good deal, if it was something you have no utility for, and we're never going to purchase, don't purchase it now just because it seems like you're getting a deal on it. And then the thing to remember is that these super premium cards 
they give you that bonus once and then you're paying a fee every year. Yeah, and that's an interesting point as well. And that's not, obviously I, I have one and I have zero complaints, but let's take a card, for instance, where it says, okay, you're going to sign up, you're going to spend six grand, you pay me 250 or 500 or whatever it is a year. And in that first month, I'm going to give you 100,000 points. Okay, great. I have a card like that that I've had for probably a year and a half now. I mean, on my own, I certainly have not accumulated 100,000 points, right? I got that one-time bonus, um, but that's unlikely to really pay off in the same way. So I think that's just something to keep in mind of you've got to spend a decent amount of money for those bonuses, at least in the short term, to really equate to something meaningful for most people, right? I mean, because, again, it's taken me a year and a half, and I'm still not at the amount the bonus was given. Um, I think people don't realize that. It's like, yeah, okay, you know, 100,000 points would say it's 1,000 bucks in reward points if you for signing up. Okay, well, that's if you're spending 250 a year for the card, you've paid for that bonus in four years. You might have spent six grand, you've never had any intention of spending. Um, and now it's gone because you booked a flight and you did whatever you did with it. And it's going to take you another five years to get back to that amount. Meanwhile, you're paying 250 a year the whole time. Um, so, I mean, I'm not, I'm certainly not dissuading anyone from using a credit card, but to think that you're going to get the best of the company, right? Because I think that's what some people think they're doing. Oh, oh, I'm getting such a good deal. I'm beating Amex today. Yeah. You're not beating Amex. You have that card likely forever now. And then people are scared of closing the card because they don't want to hurt their credit score. Yeah. So I just say, again, not dissuading anyone from using credit. I have zero complaints about my credit card. I use it all the time. I'm just saying, don't get into it thinking you are somehow gaming the system and coming out ahead. You're not. It's just the price of doing business. And I think it's a pretty fair deal as long as you use it responsibly. Um, I want to get a little into kind of warnings or horror stories. I'm going to start with things that I've seen that I think are BS, and you can confirm or deny if they're BS. The main one I've seen is, hey, I have um, this credit card, and I, I'm carrying this $30,000 balance, but I'm going to get another credit card and pay off that credit card with this new one, as if somehow you know, your, your credit score is not going to notice that, oh, wow, he paid it all off. He must be responsible now. <laughs> they know you're carrying it over here now. Yeah, so a lot of credit card companies will let you do this thing called a balance transfer because every credit card company wants as many customers as possible. So let's say I have a $10,000 balance on my Bank of America card. Wells Fargo might reach out to me and say, hey, you can transfer your balance on this over to us. We'll pay off your old bill. We'll open up a new card for you with that $10,000 balance, and you won't have to pay it off for 12 months. And so that is compelling to a lot of people. Hey, like I'm racking up interest charges on this balance. I can put that off for 12 months. And so that is something that I do recommend that people take advantage of if they need extra time to pay off their balance. But don't think that now your balance is gone. A lot of the time, these companies will let you do that. Hey, we, we won't, you won't have to pay interest for 12 months, but guess what? After that 12 months, your interest is going to be higher than what it was before. Yeah. So that was going to be my caveat there was make sure you have a game plan, right? For those 12 months, because right, like you said, it's likely higher. Um, what about, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'll ask anyway, I've seen people who say, look, you know, I got, um, all this credit card debt, one over here, and I got this kind of, you know, I got this debt for student loans and whatever. What if I consolidate? Can I consolidate it all into one thing? And I, I, to me, the answer has always been, well, if you can get a lower interest rate by consolidating, depending on the terms of that loan agreement, then that would make more sense to me. Is that correct? Yeah, and, yeah, and I do think consolidation has a good place. I think the, the thing that people don't realize is like when they're consolidating or when they're doing one of these balance transfers where they have that promotional period, 
it is easy to get head faked into, hey, I'm not having to pay as much balance down anymore. So now I have more money to go spend. And so that total balance that you maybe used to be paying 10% on that now you're paying 7% on, that total balance is now rising. And so mm-hmm. overall, you may end up paying more in the long run because psychologically you think you have more money to spend, but you're still in debt. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's not, I mean, uh, it's just reminding me of conversations we have frequently with people in terms of psychology of, of money, debt, investing, et cetera, where, you know, sometimes people come into, and granted, this is a case of not necessarily credit card debt, what I guess we would consider debt, debt that goes towards an access. Um, hopefully appreciating money. But people would say, hey, I just came into a lump sum of money. And should I pay off my house with it or should I invest it? And usually, mathematically, depending on, well, let's say it's a house, credit card, whatever it may be, depending on the interest rate, right? There's a mathematically correct answer. And it usually comes down to, well, what can you average in an investment account versus what is the rate on the debt? And whichever one is higher is mathematically where you should go. But there is this strange psychology of, let's say it's a mortgage and they have, um, let's just stay at the high rate, let's say it's six six and a half percent interest rate on their, on their loan for the house. We usually say, depending on the person, like, I trust that you will not, if you have not so far, miss a mortgage. I believe you will do that. So I think you should invest it today because I think if you pay off the house, you will not view that as, oh, I no longer have a mortgage payment. Now that can go into my investment account. You will view that as I no longer have a mortgage payment. Now look at all the fun I can have, which I think is not dissimilar from what you're saying with these consolidation things of, oh, well, you know, I don't have all these things to pay off anymore. So now that's just money I can spend. That's not the case. Yeah. And, the, and the thing, like when you're talking about just the mathematical side of it, you know, credit card interest rates are going to be almost over 30% at this point. Right. The way interest rates for credit cards work is they're variable and they're tied to the Fed interest rate. And so with interest rates being so high right now, those credit card interest rates are even higher right now too. And so it's almost always a good idea to pay off your credit card balances first. And, you know, you said, hey, I trust that you're not going to miss your mortgage payment. If you've got a balance on your credit card that you're paying interest on and you're racking up debt, guess what? You've already missed a credit card payment. And so it's time to pay that down right away. Right. And that that is a different, right? That's the good versus maybe not so good of debt conversation, right? Because yeah, the mortgage, you need a place to live. I trust you're going to do it. You've been doing it. Versus if you tell me, hey, I got 40 grand of credit card debt and it's charging me 30% of interest while it sits there, well, then, yeah, you should get, I mean, from a mathematical and psychological standpoint, you should clearly get rid of this because you've shown you're not responsible. Um, talk to me a little. So the variable side of it, I mean, that's not variable upon. It's not like, hey, I signed up for this credit card. And at that time, the rate was 20 percent. And it will always be 20 percent. They can change it whenever economically, you know, like you said, with Fed raising interest rates, when that happens, they can go ahead and do the same. Yeah, so there's actually a lot that goes into it. And there's laws around credit cards not bait and switching you and not, you know, charging you a lot more than they said they would. But if you read the terms of your credit card agreement, they're long. But nobody does. No one does it. And they're long. And so, you know, if you're the kind of person who's going to go open up a credit card, set up auto pay for the full balance every month right away, you really don't need to read those terms all that much. Right. But if you are potentially paying interest, the most credit cards are going to be variable. And there's a couple of things that goes into it. The first one is introduction pricing. A lot of these places, they'll say, hey, first 12 months, you don't need to pay us any interest. Mm-hmm. Go, ahead, go ahead and rack up as much debt as you want. You know, that's how they get you. Right. And then like 13 yeah. months roll around. Now you're paying interest on you. Know, you maybe have built up bad habits and now you're paying interest. Yeah, I mean, is that what you would consider predatory? I mean, I've certainly seen what I consider to be predatory. And granted, it's not necessarily credit cards. Um, I'll take an instance. There was a woman who needed a new roof. And she was a little elderly. And somebody came to the door and said, hey, we know you need a new roof. We'll, we'll give you the money for it. 
and it's 12 months interest free. Well, okay. She had no means to pay it off. And I, I would assume they kind of knew that. So is that what you would define as predatory? I mean, I guess it depends on the person, but to me, it's if I you're think not it can money. Be. Yeah. I think I think it really can be. And it's it's more just like it's giving people a chance to build bad habits. And you know. If you build bad habits, then the credit card company is going to notice and they're going to assess fees and um, you might get into a hole. But the other thing is, is like sometimes those kind of like interest free for 12 months, 18 months, they can be really beneficial to a lot of people. Because let's say you, you know, your roof collapses from a hurricane and you don't have the money to pay for a new roof right now, you'd rather not start paying interest right away on that payment, you can have 12 months to kind of save better and then pay yeah. that off over time. So they can be really helpful to a lot of people. I mean, I, I'm in business school right now, full-time student. Most of my classmates are not making money right now, but still have expenses. And so what people are doing is they're saying, hey, in 18 months, I'm expecting to have a job. I'm expecting to maybe even get some sort of sign-on bonus. And at that point, I'll be able to pay down my debt. So let me get a 12-month, 18-month, no-interest credit card to use now instead of the credit card that I was using before when I did have a job. And then you know, down the line, I'll be able to pay that down. So let's talk about how would I phrase this. I guess credit card companies or any type of loan properly vetting who they are loaning to, meaning, you know, if if I say, all right, your credit limit is 50 grand, I know you make $20,000 a year. Uh, I mean, to me, that seems like you're setting somebody up for failure. I'm not here to, you know, philosophically argue what's wrong or right. Um, but what what is that process? I mean, how do they determine a limit for somebody? And how many people are receiving access to an amount of money that they have no reasonable means of actually paying off? Yeah, and you know that's a lot of what my job was at Capital One was determining how much credit do we want to give somebody. You don't want to insult them with a super low amount. But you also don't want to put them in a position where they may go into debt. Ultimately, the credit card companies want to get paid back, right? Like they don't want to have that many losses. So it is a delicate balance for them. And so what goes into that? Your, your credit score, your FICO score, still the biggest thing that people use. However, over time, especially the last five to 10 years, there's so much information has become out there, you know, um, Every single bank pretty much gives a free credit score checker now that anyone can use, even if you're not a customer. You know, you can use Credit Karma, Nerd Wallet, lots of places to go to see what your credit score is, learn how to improve your credit score. There's even, you know, things like Experian Boost that'll help you boost your FICO score for, you know, if you if, like show them your utility payments, something yeah. like that. And so FICO scores have really become inflated for a big portion of America. So banks are using more alternative data now, more internal data now to figure out, is this person credit worthy? So, you know, with machine learning and all the sophisticated algorithms out there, these banks have crazy models to figure out how risky it is to, to give you a loan and how much of a loan they should give you based on data the bank has, based on data they go buy. So, I used to work in new to credit. So that was giving cards to people who had no FICO score. They have no data on any of the three credit bureaus, which are uh, you know, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. These are the people that kind of house all of this data for the country. And without all of that data, like how are you even gonna know? So generally you'll start with a really small loan, but there are also other places you can go to figure out, is this somebody that I wanna give a loan to, right? So we had a big student business. So there are companies out there that keep track of everybody who's enrolled in a college. 
And so we would buy data from them and say, hey, like, can you verify that somebody is actually a student at the University of Florida like they say they are? If so, that's a good thing, right? Like they're not lying on their application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have no data otherwise. So, you know, maybe you'll get a thousand dollar credit limit instead of a three hundred dollar credit limit if we can verify something like that. Yeah, I think I think Banana Republic gave me like three grand. At the time, that was the biggest risk they were willing to take on me. But that that makes sense. Um, all right. Well, last last kind of thoughts. I mean, is there anything in your mind where you go, "Hey, these are absolutely the wrong ways to use credit," or anything where you say, "Hey, I think people are missing this opportunity with it." Yeah, I think that you know the the best way to use credit is to open up a card with no fee that gives you rewards on things that you pay that you are already spending money on. And then enrolling in auto pay to pay down the full balance every month. I would say the biggest things are just do auto pay so you don't have to think about it. Pay down your full balance so you're not getting interest fees. And if you are paying an annual fee for the car, make sure you're actually getting your, your money's worth. You know, if you are a really heavy spender, you, you know, you've got a whole family you're spending money on, those annual fees definitely make sense. I've got two cards in my wallet with with annual fees. And I feel like one of them, I'm definitely getting my money's worth. The other one, some years, yes, some years, no. But, yeah. you know, when I, when I am doing a lot of travel, maybe it makes sense. When I'm not, maybe it doesn't. Um, but I would say really just like do the math when you first start. Think about what sort of rewards are you getting? Look at your budget. What are you already spending money on? If you're spending a lot of money on groceries, get a card that's giving you good rewards for groceries. If you're spending a lot of money at Walmart, go get a Walmart card. If you're spending a lot of money on travel, go get a premium travel card, but make sure you know what you're doing. And so you can get a ton of rewards out of basically making sure you get those sign-on bonuses, making sure you're spending money in the categories that reward you. You know, a lot of people compartmentalize their spend based on categories, right? Like you only use your grocery card at the grocery store. You only use your travel card when you're paying for travel. You only use your dining card, et cetera. So that works for a lot of people. Some people, it doesn't work as much. Some people don't want to think about it that much. So there are these kind of catch-all 2% on everything, 1% on everything cards that I would recommend, especially for people who are just starting out with credit and don't want to have to think about it a lot. Um, another thing to watch out for is caps on the rewards that you can earn. So some, you know, just really look at what the rewards are. You don't need to read the whole, you don't need to read the whole, you know, 40 page agreement, but make sure you understand, <laughs> make sure you understand what rewards you're getting. Make sure you understand what sort of interest and other fees you might be paying. Uh, and then, you know, there's this whole aspect when it comes to getting the most out of your card with basically earn and burn. So there's an amount of rewards that you earn when you spend money on things. And then there's an amount of rewards that you redeem when you burn on things. And so I think that that is an aspect that a lot of people don't really know about. And so credit card companies will recommend that you you know you get your rewards back through gift cards or something like that because that's cheaper for them than just right. giving you straight cash back um there's this thing called like cents per point that people think about when they like are really into credit cards generally if you get a point for a credit card it's worth one penny but if you, you know, transfer it to United and then use it to redeem. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, so I've you seen, you get know, up to two cents. Yeah. It's, it's like, oh, here's your, here's your point hack. You move it from Amex, uh, but it's not a partner with uh, American. So you go to British and then from British, you get a flight from, I don't know where, and then it lands and you have three X your points. I mean, I would imagine there's some legitimacy to that. For me, it's like, I got to weigh the time it's going to take me to figure out where do I transfer these to? When are they having some type of, you know, multiplier on the rewards? And for me, it's like, it's not, it's not worth the hours. It's going to take it's not worth it all times. that out. Yeah. It's, and there's so much that goes into it. And these credit card companies, they make so much money off of these things. And there's so much competition to give rich rewards, but they're changing their rewards all the time. And so 
it does take a lot of effort to really maximize those rewards. Some people find it worth it. Some people don't find it worth it. There are new companies out there that are helping make it easier. There's a, a company that I was looking at recently that uh, it's basically like an Expedia, but instead of showing uh, just all of the flights and how much it costs, it also shows how much it could cost if you used Amex points or if you use British Airways points or if you right. use United points. And so there are companies that are trying to make it easier. I saw something like, you know, for a big vacation, people may spend up to five hours just trying to figure out the best way to pay for it. Well, I, I'd rather know I have a seat, you know, I don't, that's not for me, but I, I do, I, I've gone down the rabbit hole before I, when I first started getting into credit cards. Oh yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And after about 20 minutes of looking, I'm like, nah, I'm just going to buy the ticket. So, so I would say really, you know, enroll in auto pay, do the math, figure out how much effort is worth it for you. And then just, you know, use your credit responsibly and, and use your rewards. You know, people love saying like, oh, I've got a million United points or whatever. But uh, last year, United devalued their points. And so if you were sitting on a million United points, that's probably only worth 500,000 United points now. Right, right. So go ahead and use your rewards. You know, you're, you're not going to get the better of these banks, but you can have a mutually beneficial relationship with them where you're getting rewarded for using their cards and they're getting rewarded for you using their cards and you're not getting taken advantage of because you're not paying interest and crazy fees every year. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, mean, I think, I think that is the basis of it, right? The, this is a good tool to use. There are some benefits. It's a, I would argue for most people who have the care and responsibility to use it responsibly. It's better than using cash, right? I'm getting something back for this and there is a relationship factor there and uh, hopefully opens me up to better opportunities down the road, how to use my credit, um, but just don't do silly things with it. I think it's that easy. Yeah. And, you know, you as a wealth manager, you probably suggest that people have an emergency fund available yep. to them. A credit card can be kind of that secondary emergency fund if you really need to tap into it. And so paying interest for a month or two months in order to buy groceries for your family because, you know, you were furloughed for two months, like that's something that is beneficial. And, you know, that temporary loan from a credit card, that's the only place you can get money from it's better than going to a payday lender. Yeah, no, I mean, I would agree. Again, it's kind of a parachute option. Yeah. Yeah, I'd much rather say, so, okay, you know, I didn't have the emergency fund saved up and I have reasonable means if I have to spend this money today that I can pay off the interest and, and essentially a loan um, in the next few months before it gets out of hand and snowballs. Yeah, I, I have no problem with that line of thinking. But um, all right, well, unless you got anything else, I'll stop the recording and then we can talk really quick about what the hell the Orlando Magic are doing. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, let's let's... You know, we'll definitely get into that. Um, but, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, thanks for having me on the podcast. Uh, great to talk about things. I really think that credit is a good tool for people. Uh, it's important to be able to show banks and show lenders that you are responsible with credit, but that means you need to be responsible with your credit. And, um, you know, I feel like I get a ton out of my credit cards in terms of rewards because I'm using it responsibly. And, uh, my, you know, I once opened up my phone, my like credit card app and showed a landlord my credit score right on the app. And that secured a rental application right then yeah. for me. And so it really can be that kind of VIP pass to for your finances. And so it's important to build it. It's important to care about it. It's important to look at it, right? Like, the other thing that's great about credit cards is like fraud protection, right? Like, oh yeah, you know, we didn't we didn't talk about fraud much, but you know, cards don't want to be taken advantage of by identity thieves, and mm -hmm. you don't either. And so, you know, it's it's that kind of that mutual incentive to make sure that all your payments are secure. So, uh, I think it's great for a lot of things. I think people do need to be careful with it, but you know, uh, there's a lot of resources out there. Yeah, I mentioned a couple yeah. of them, uh, but I would I would recommend that people 
do their due diligence when they're deciding which credit card to get and uh, when they are using it over time. Good deal. All right. Well, we appreciate it very much.